Welcome to this uh, second lecture of the Basel Reproducibility uh, Seminar Series. And uh, today uh, we are extremely honored to have uh, Ron Wasserstein, uh, an esteemed statistician, talking about moving to a world beyond uh, P less than 0 0.05. And uh, Ron Wasserstein has served as the executive director of the American Statistical Association since August 2007. And prior to joining the ASA, Wasserstein was a mathematics and statistics department faculty member and administrator at the Washburn University in Topeka, Kansas from 1984 to 2007 when he took the position at the ASA. So as I said, we're extremely lucky to have him as a speaker. I've heard him uh, uh, speak in other occasions and he's very engaging. So I trust that you all will uh, enjoy this talk very much. Ron, thank you, and uh, please go ahead. Well, thank you, and I feel uh, really the lucky one and privileged to have the opportunity to um, speak with you today. And when I um, uh, was putting the finishing touches on this presentation, I went to your website, and um, and let's see here, there we go. Um, I suddenly realized that I'm with my people. I, I just, I like, wow, I, I, uh, I understand this. So let me, um, I need to make a little adjustment here so that the zoom bar is not right where I need it to be. So I'm so glad to, um, have the chance to talk with you. And before I begin, let me just ask a question to see, um, how one of my examples is going to land in, in, in Europe, um, as young people are learning to drive, do they have class that they have to take? Some in, in, the, in the US, it's called driver education. Is there similar um, in Europe? I think so. There is some heterogeneity over Europe, but I guess okay. we'll have to. All right. Well, hopefully this, uh, this what I'm going to say is going to make sense. So, all right. Um, here we go. The uh, so imagine um, the car that you would have if money was no object to you, okay? What what you would own in in that case, and maybe uh, maybe you would dream big of one of these, you know, really super expensive cars. Maybe you'd be more along the lines, um, and this is probably uh, uh, more like me uh, to one of these famous movie cars, at least famous movies. Um, in the U.S., the uh, perhaps something more of a cartoon car um, would be the uh, the thing that you would choose. Um, I'll be honest; I'm uh, I'm kind of fond of the um, DeLorean from uh, the 1985 movie Back to the Future. But whatever the car would be, let's just imagine that you that we just had the most you know like amazing car that's. Uh, that's ever been made. It uh, it's beautiful. It's energy efficient. It's it's cheap. People have access to it. Anyone anyone can use it. It has one problem. It turns out to be uh, a difficult vehicle to drive. So there's just crashes everywhere um, using this vehicle. So one of the things that people would would suggest and have suggested is that. Um, you know, in such a situation would be, well, we just need to train the drivers better. Um, if people use the car correctly, there won't be, there won't be crashes and, um, and that'll take care of it. Well, that's been the story with the test drive, as it were, of statistical significance for nearly a hundred years now. And it's still being said that, you know, there's really no problem with p-values and statistical significance. The problem is that people don't use it right. We just need to teach them properly. But at some point, you have to ask yourself, how long is that going to take? What is a viable solution? And let's, let's look at a quote here from none other than D.R. Cox, who wrote um, in this paper you see here, it's been widely felt probably for 30 years and more, that significance tests are overemphasized and often misused, and that more emphasis should be put on estimation and prediction. Cox wrote that in 1986, 
and he refers to 30 years or more. So that's 1956, at least, and I'll own up that that's the year of my birth. So I'm saying to you that for at least my entire lifetime, this has been a problem. Here's another wonderful quote from uh, 1963. The null hypothesis of no difference has been judged to be no longer a sound or fruitful basis for statistical investigation. See this again, 1963, that's 60 years ago. Significance tests do not provide the information that scientists need. And furthermore, they are not the most effective method for analyzing and summarizing data. And if we look back uh, about 30 years to this wonderfully titled uh, article by Jacob Cohen, The Earth is Round, P Lesson 0.05, he wrote, what's wrong with null hypothesis significance testing? Well, among other things, it does not tell us what we want to know. And we so much want to know what we want to know that out of desperation, we nevertheless believe that it does. So my point here is that we've been talking about this for so long, we've got to understand that more education, more driver education in my um, uh, silly little example is not going to do the trick. And in fact, there's research to back that up. Um, Ray Hubbard, uh, looked at thousands of articles and showed that the um, that the number of citations of articles critical of significance testing or warning of its dangers has grown over these last six decades. But at the same time, the percentage of papers in many disciplines that use it also has increased. So, and that's you know the key word there is is, is percentage. It's growing as a as a percentage of the number of papers. Okay, this is the disclaimer portion of the talk. Um, I'm the executive director of the ASA, a position that I love and um, am, am, am so pleased that I have the opportunity to serve in, but I'm not here today on behalf of the ASA. I'm just, uh, I'm speaking uh, as an individual researcher. So don't blame the ASA for anything that uh, you don't like or, you know, you don't even need to credit the ASA for anything you do like, but um, I'm the source. And and I might say many others, in, including, you know, I've been, you know, I don't see who all is on the call right this moment, but I saw Valentin earlier, and he's been a, a huge um, uh, encouragement and inspiration to me. So let's talk about significant. R.A. Fisher introduced the term, really popularized the term in 1925. And when he used it, um, he meant that the result was worth further scrutiny. Now there's, as I'll show momentarily, there's no sense of the word significant that Im implies that. So that's a mistake right off the bat. And it's a mistake that um, that Fisher acknowledged in his later life. He, if, uh, if there had been such a thing as an undo button, he would have probably pressed it on this one because the word significant means something in ordinary language that's quite a bit different than worth further scrutiny. Let's look at this in a number of ways. So, so consider, for example, opposites of significant. So insignificant, unimportant, meaningless. These are not opposites that suggest, you know, uh, a mild or tame meaning of significant. Let's look at significant as an adjective. So a significant increase. Well, we want that if it's in our if it's in our paycheck, we don't want it if it's in the price of food. We have significant events, um, uh, uh, weddings, funerals, um, bar mitzvahs, etc. We even um, sometimes refer to um, people as significant others. And you wouldn't say to your significant others, um, you know, I... Uh, I feel like our relationship is worth further scrutiny. Now, that's probably not a good way to talk to your significant other. Let's try this on a different way. Um, I want you to think about the word mole and just let sit in your mind the first thing that comes to your head when you think about the word mole. It might have been this creature that can dig up your backyard. It might have been a particularly well-placed spy. 
it might be the first thought you had was of this kind of skin blemish. But given this crowd, um, you probably thought of a unit of measure as the uh, uh, as the first meaning. But whichever of those you thought of, there's no confusion, okay? Because the context of the word would always dictate the, the meaning of the word. That's just not true of the word significant, uh, unfortunately, as, as it's used. One of my favorite movies, maybe some of you have seen it, is a movie called The Princess Bride, in which one of the characters continually uses the word inconceivable uh, incorrectly. And there was a wonderful article 10 years ago in Scientific American uh, about seven misused scientific words. For example, the word hypothesis is uh, has a specific meaning to scientists. Uh, it's a proposed explanation that can be tested. It's something that you could actually check out. Um, we use hypothesis um, uh, in normal language all the time, but it doesn't mean this. You know, I have a hypothesis why your mother doesn't like me. Um, well, that's a that's a guess. Uh, there's probably not a good test for that, not a scientific test anyway. Theory is another such word. Um, the The whole concept of just a theory, that's just a theory that I have, doesn't play with scientists because a theory um, is an explanation that has lots behind it. Okay, there's there's the uh, the theory of relativity the the theory of evolution, these are things that have um, uh, uh, have weight behind them. They have, um, they have experimentation and so on. And the number six word on the list was the word significant. Here's an example I've been using uh, uh, to drive the, home the difference between what Fisher was saying and what we think of with the word significant. Um, and that is uh, Tinder. So I'm going to ask you to imagine Tinder, but this Tinder is not to uh, not to find uh, another person, but to find a p-value that you like. And uh, maybe you come across this um, this p-value, okay, of 0.03. That's a good that's a that's a good looking p-value. So you want to you want to uh, right swipe for that, right? You want to um, you want to investigate that a little further. So. This is what Fisher was suggesting with uh, the use of the word significant, that the results are interesting. And maybe, you know, we need to investigate them more. Um, look at it a little more, look at it a little more deeply. Not ready to uh, not ready to, you know, go charging out the door with this result. But unfortunately, this is what happens in the real world. People fall in love with their p-value. You tiny, beautiful p-value, you are the result that I want to spend the rest of my research life with. Let's publish and get grants together. I love you, small p-value. That's the sense that significance has taken on. And I'm going to say more about that uh, in a little bit. But I um, uh, uh, now's a good time. To think about you know sort of like how we got here okay because for something to be declared statistically significant it has to meet a threshold and you all know that that threshold has historically been p less than 0.05 you also all know that it doesn't have to be that it never had to be that um there's a there's you know a whole theory that was um, developed not long after Fisher, um, involving alphas and betas and uh, relative uh, uh, risks associated with those uh, type one and type two errors and so on. But let's focus in on that threshold of p less than 0.05. And let me try to illustrate with another example why it's so problematic. Let's think about things that have boundary lines, all right? So I'm gonna argue, uh, well, I'm, I'm gonna classify things with boundary lines 
into a two by two table, okay? I'm gonna argue that the boundary lines can be arbitrary lines, or there could be a rational explanation for the lines. Then I'm gonna argue that some boundary lines are needed and some boundary lines are not needed. Um, this is the first time I've, I've tried this little two by two thing out on anybody. Um, and you can maybe help me uh, improve this, uh, this illustration uh, in the discussion. All right, let's take, let's take football, let's take soccer, all right? You, you need boundaries in soccer, and I'm going to show uh, a little bit more about this in a minute. You need it, the ball, you need, you need the, the playing fields, you need the ball in or out. But the size of a soccer field is arbitrary. Um, not all soccer fields are the same size, and if you were to go to the to the FIFA rule book, you would see that there's there's um, uh, variation allowed in both length and width of the pitch. So uh, the size of a soccer field is arbitrary. Those boundaries are arbitrary, but they're necessary. The game would be chaos without it. All right, let's think about property boundaries, okay? Those are necessary boundaries, but they're not arbitrary. At some point in time, um, property uh, in your area was uh, divided up and there are there are lines in different countries. They're marked in different ways. Um, uh, in the U.S., oftentimes those uh, 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 property uh, things are, are, are marked by distances from certain fixed points. But anyway, there's a reason, there's a rationale uh, for uh, those lines and they're necessary because they say this is where my property ends and my neighbor's property begins. All right. It's harder to come up with a rational boundary line that's unnecessary, but I've uh, had the privilege of, of traveling uh, to a lot of places, and I've been in certain countries where there are traffic lanes, but nobody pays any attention to them at all. So they're rational. There's a reason those traffic lanes were there, but they're unnecessary in the sense that they're more like artwork. Nobody is actually paying any uh, attention to them. Their suggestions at best. Well, I'm going to argue in the next few slides that the example of an arbitrary and unnecessary um, boundary line is the boundary line P less than 0.05. So let's take a closer look. All right. In sports, you have boundary lines. And depending on the sport, the boundary line is either still in or it's out. Okay, so in these sports you see listed here, I'll uh, I'll focus on soccer. Uh, if the ball's on the line, the ball is still in. Okay, it's still in play. If it goes past the line, um, then it's out of play. In at least these two uh, American sports, um, the, the ball is out of bounds, or the player is out of bounds if they if they touch the line. So the line is not part of play. The line is out of bounds. Whatever the rule is, people who play the game know the rule, and these boundaries are essential. They're integral to the play of the game. Uh, you can't play the game without the without the boundaries. You can't play it at a, any kind of high level anyway. And the outcome of landing outside the boundary produces a different outcome than landing inside. Okay, I... I, um, I'm a big fan of American football. I'm sporting my Kansas City Chiefs uh, shirt right now. And if a player catches the ball, um, a pass at the back of the end zone, inbounds, that's a touchdown. And that's worth points. And that could be the difference in winning the game. And if that player catches the ball just outside of that boundary, then it's an incomplete pass and, and no points. And again, that has a huge impact of the game. So as I pointed out, <coughs> pardon me, in that, um, in that two by two table, the sports boundaries are established arbitrarily over time. There's nothing magical in the world that makes a football field the size that it is. 
it's it was established over the over the history of the sport in some cases the size of the of the playing area but you got to have those boundaries in order to regulate play but how about this boundary okay this p less than 0.05 boundary is it arbitrary is it necessary well let's point out that just like in sports landing outside of this boundary produces a very different outcome than landing inside we treat p greater than 0.05 as um being um uh very different than p less than 0.05 it it these these terms here describe it things does it mean that because p is greater than 0.05 that the results are are not deserving of publication they're not worth attention they're not scientifically meaningful um and uh, on the other side of the line does that make those uh uh does that make the opposite of those things true the uh sorry you're gonna hear my uh whiny puppy in the in the background she she has everything she needs um the uh um this uh this is an arbitrary boundary okay there was nothing magic about 0.05. Fisher didn't come up with 0.05 based on some sort of consensus perspective on what, what merit means. It was handy computationally. Um, it had a good feel uh, to it. You know, this kind of this 19 out of 20 sort of thing. Um, but it's a convenience based on history. The, um, uh, but it's an unnecessary boundary. It's, it's, significant doesn't really add anything it doesn't mean that the observed effect is not due to chance it doesn't mean that that the effect is true or real or any of the other common misinterpretations so we have an arbitrary unnecessary boundary declaring something statistically significant is an ending point it should be a starting point for discussion, but it's an ending point. And a declaration of statistical significance does not convey anything useful beyond what is conveyed by the p-value itself. Bright line thinking is the result. And the problem with bright lines is that they lead us to treat results on opposite sides of the line very diff differently, even if the practical implications of those differences are essentially identical and when you have a rule then the rule establishes exactly how to achieve a desired outcome by manipulation and for and unfortunately once achieved that result usually gains more weight than is deserved so think of this again with the sports analogy the we know where the boundaries are so we know we use every trick in the book to use every inch of that field while staying within the boundary so a winger in soccer is gonna is gonna try to make uh, as much use of that of that sideline as as they can um, uh, uh, to, to make things successful and people are going to figure out how to get themselves into the green zone of P less than 0.05 as they were and I love this quote from Rosenau and Rosenthal um, who wrote that uh, we only wish to emphasize, that dichotomous significance testing has no ontological basis. That is, we want to underscore that surely God loves the 0.06 as much as the 0.05. What I want to show you now is some um, uh, quotes from, from the literature, okay? These are things that people actually wrote when they have a p-value that's equal to or nearly equal to 0.06. So, for example, almost significant almost attained significance, almost significant tendency, almost became significant, almost but not quite significant, almost statistically significant. <clears throat> you see what's going on here? Almost reached statistical significance, just barely below the level of significance, just beyond significance. Why are they writing these things? Because they have to explain somehow that their p-value didn't make it under 0.05. All right. 
here are people with a little bit bigger problem because they have a bigger p-value. So they write a, a certain trend toward significance, a definite trend, a slight tendency toward significance, a strong trend toward significance, a trend close to significance. You see the trend here, although it's really hard to think of a p-value as a trend when it's a single number, an expected trend approaching our criteria of significance, approaching borderline significance, which I always say sounds like a condition to me of some kind, approaching, although not reaching, significance. All right, here are the people with a really large problem, okay? That is that they have a p-value that's close to, but not less than 0.05, hovered at a nearly significant level, hovers on the brink, just about significant, just above, just at the conventional level of significance because somehow we needed all those digits. Just barely significant. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna call it good. Just borderline significant. There's that condition again. Just escaped significance, just failed significance. All right. These are things written by perfectly sensible human beings, people like you and me who are trying to do research and trying to um, uh, advance uh, science and felt compelled to write things like this. Why? Because they had a p-value that didn't get across the threshold and they felt like they had to explain it or they weren't going to get published or get funded or whatever it might be. And here's the source for those quotes and many more. All right, you might think at this point that I'm exaggerating the problem. So let me let me show you how this actually played out in a situation during COVID, okay? This uh, drug at the time was being tested. It's a drug called um, remdesivir. It's a drug for treating COVID once people have it. So it's not a, it's not a vaccine, but it's for, um, it's for treating uh, the, uh, the symptoms of COVID. So it treats the effects and preliminary results indicated that patients who received remdesivir had a 31% faster time to recovery than those who received the placebo. Boy, that is, that's, that's a big effect. Um, specifically, the median time to recovery was 11 days for patients treated with, with remdesivir compared with 15 days for those who received the placebo. Okay, if you're suffering, Four days is a big difference, and if you're if you're needing to staff a hospital, um, being able to release patients four days earlier um, because there's there's you know more patients coming in, that's a big deal. And then there was also this result. Take a good look. Results also suggested a survival benefit with a mortality rate of eight percent for the group receiving remdesivir versus eleven point six percent for the placebo group. And I, uh, I really do apologize for all this uh, coughing. I, uh, I'll just own up. I had a recent surgery on my on my neck, and my throat is just a, a little bit sore. Um, okay, you see here, p less than 0.05, um, but a mortality rate of you know a 3.6 percent uh, difference there in mortality rate. So that was good news. Both of those things were good news. But then this happened on national TV. So um, some of you who follow things in the U.S. will recognize that the person on the left was uh, is Dr. Anthony Fauci. To his left uh, is Deborah Burks, who also was a, a physician and majorly involved in, in COVID. To her left is John Bell Edwards, who was the governor of Louisiana. And his left was... oh. I can't remember who that is. I'll, I'll look it up later. So Dr. Fauci mentioned statistical significance multiple times in this little uh, press meeting in the, in the White House. He referred to the reduction in time to recovery as being highly significant, which in the context of the press conference and general understanding of statistical significance is confounding the size of the p-value with the size of the effect. And worse, for the one that was not quite statistically significant, i.e. wasn't less than 0.05, 
he actually used the, the, the trending word. He said that that the mortality reduction was trending towards significance, had not yet reached statistical significance, but the data need to be further analyzed, which just reinforces the whole idea that you can p-hack your way uh, into, into success. And and for what? The we know the 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 effect size. We don't know a confidence interval on it. That'd been nice, but we know the effect size. We know the p-value. There is nothing added to slapping significance or not significance onto this. It adds no new information, but it clearly adds confusion. Now, there was a happy ending. Um, remdesivir was approved. It's marketed as something called Veclery, and it's been effectively used to treat um, COVID patients. And it's one of several treatments that has greatly helped to reduce mortality in COVID patients. Um, I'm going to skip this second example. It's a really interesting example, but there's not enough time. But I planned that ahead of time. Um, there's another example farther on that I'll skip as well, but I will be making these slides available so that you can peruse that example if you wish. My point is, I, I, I think you know by now that it's time to move on. It's time to say farewell to statistical significance and uh, to take other strategies. And why? Because significance has lost its meaning. As I've shown you here, we've talked a little bit about some bizarre behaviors that result from bright lines. I've shown you that decades of complaining have done nothing about it, that adding a label of statistical significance adds nothing to what's already conveyed by the value of P, that dichotomizing actually makes things worse. I don't really have time to get into the file drawer effect, but I bet many of you are, are familiar with it. Um, one way of, of looking at the file drawer effect is to imagine um, 100 studies of a of a treatment that is no better than the placebo. No better. It's effectively just a placebo. But you have 100 studies. Um, on average, um, five of them are going to uh, be statistically significant and could be published. And the other 95% go in a file drawer, where in that case, they, they maybe they belong. And um, and then the the uh, error rate in in the in publications is 100%. So we need to change. Um, I think many of you are already on board on that, but you if you are and you've been working at it, you know that it's difficult um, because the the basic explanation for why people use this is not philosophical or scientific, but it's it has a sociological. Uh, basis, uh, 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 argues um, Steve Goodman, says it's the same reason we use money. Um, when everyone believes in something's value, we use it for real things, money for food and p-values for knowledge claims, publication, funding, and promotion. It doesn't matter if the p-value doesn't mean what people think it means. It becomes valuable because of what it buys. So, um, I'm going to very briefly list some things that we could do differently um, uh, instead of using statistical significance. And then um, hopefully there'll be plenty of time for questions and discussion. But first, let me note that there are opposing views. There are, um, there are people who think very differently about this. And um, uh, uh, as best as I can tell, the, the opposing views fall into four categories. Um, the ones that you see on the screen here and that I'll elaborate on uh, briefly now. So the first category is that without p-values, we're essentially creating what we would talk about in, in the U.S. as the Wild West. And none other than John Ioannidis wrote that, that if we banned statistical significance, it would create a state of statistical anarchy. Wow, that's got to be the worst kind of anarchy. And without clear rules for the analysis Science and policy may rely less on data and evidence and more on subjective opinions and interpretations. There's another argument that basically says, um, we, we have a, 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 an expression, did you throw out the baby with the bathwater? I don't understand that, the, the history of that expression since I believe not in the entire history of the world, 
has a baby ever been thrown out with the bathwater? But the idea means if you get rid of one thing, do you get rid of the whole thing? And that is actually an article that one of my former bosses made um, in uh, in Amstat News, our member magazine, uh, when writing, researchers may read the call to abandon statistical significance as abandon statistical methods altogether. So the concern there is that we will delegitimize statistics if we delegitimize statistical significance. Other people argue that there's no difference between uh, statistical significance and p-values and other kinds of measures. For example, the uh, my esteemed colleague, Yoav Benjamini, makes the argument that the same problems would arise for likelihood ratios and posterior odds, you know, Bayes effects and, and, and so on, Bayes factors, I mean, sorry. Um, and I don't dispute that at all. Everything that I showed you about, about, um, about boundaries applies to anything that uh, is, has an arbitrary and unnecessary boundary associated with it. It's just that we, uh, well, we know that this happens with p-values. And then the other argument is decisions are dichotomous so that we have to, we have to have some way to make them. So um, uh, in, in this article, you see they, they uh, highlighted here, it says inferences are unavoidably dichotomous, especially in medical medicine and healthcare. Um, and then uh, the ASA's President's Task Force on Statistical Significance and Replicability makes a similar argument. They say that thresholds are helpful when actions are required. And they go on to say that if thresholds are deemed necessary, they should be explicitly defined based on study goals, considering the consequences of incorrect decisions. Okay, I'm going to briefly say, uh, br briefly uh, uh, refute um, these objections. I'll start here by saying that everybody knows, every statistician knows, and has known for decades that yes, um, if you explicitly define based on study goals and consider the consequences of incorrect decisions, things work better, but that doesn't happen. It's never happened, it's not happening. So do we, do we solve the problem of a wild, wild west by, by using a, a tool that's not fit for purpose? Um, I can't, I don't know what to make of the baby in the bathwater argument, other than to say that that bathwater is really old by now. And it's fair that other methods can be misused, but we know that the p-value is misused. And sure, decisions are sometimes dichotomous, but it's it's the evidence that's not dichotomous. So my concern is that we overstate what statistics can produce when we make these kinds of arguments. Right, real quickly, um, and then we can discuss any of these points in more detail um, in, in, in a moment. What are things we can do instead? Well, if we're telling people to stop using thresholds to interpret p-values, then we could ask a question. And that question would simply be, what do we, what would you do if you'd never, if you'd never heard of this p-value, p less than 0.05 thing, what would you have to do? Um, what are some things that you could do instead? Well, let's take a look. So here are five things you could do easily. So instead of leading off with the p-value, lead off with focus on effect sizes and related measures of uncertainty. Start with those. Um, don't throw those in as an afterthought. And then focus on the substantive implications of your estimates. So what happens so often with confidence intervals, for example, which are you know, often used as just a, uh, another kind of, 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 of significance test, you don't wanna focus on whether the confidence interval contains zero, but whether the interval bounds have qualitatively different practical consequences. You could uh, interpret confidence intervals as compatibility intervals so that your focus 
is on how compatible the data are with your hypothesized model, which means that you're focusing on the um, the fact that there is uh, a, an underlying statistical model there. And I have an example here of the compatibility uh, interval interpretation that, that you can see with the slides, but there's just not enough time. I have so much I, I wanna say and just not quite enough time. Um, when presenting p-values, uh, present them as continuous variables. Y you know to do this. Um, and there are other things that you can do. Um, you could report uh, other p-values um, for other pre-specified hypotheses. Some, some software will, will generate a, a, a p-value distribution across different hypotheses. But one thing you could do that would be pretty straightforward um, is uh, if you can get a discussion, not easy to get, of what a minimal meaningful effect size is, use that to compute a p-value instead of the um, of the hypothesis of no effect uh, uh, being what you use to base your p-value on. And then instead of imbuing p-values with um, uh, supernatural, as it were, powers, interpret them as what they are, uncertain descriptive measures of compatibility with the model, and recognize that they're impacted by lots of things, not just the, the null hypothesis assumption, but by many other assumptions and choices that data analysts make. And then finally, the we, we could actually like, I'm, I'm sorry to be kind of snarky here, we could actually like do science here, okay? Instead of focusing on a statistical measure alone, like the p-value and and whether it's less than 0.05 or not, think about the science. Think about related prior evidence, plausibility of mechanism, study design and quality, and so on. So to wrap up, we're encouraging people to stop using statistical significance as any kind of matrix for scientific inference and to not to spend time teaching it as a foundational concept anymore. Lots of people, including some people in this uh, in this meeting, uh, have written about uh, what the world beyond P, uh, less than 0.05 should look like. And I'm not making an argument here against p-values, um, making an argument about how p-values are used uh, with respect to thresholds. So I thank you for giving me the time to um, uh, share these thoughts with you. And with any luck here, I can stop sharing my screen.